footwork on the chair standing. So now we finally come off of the uh, chair and we're going to be interfacing with the chair in a standing position. Now this is harder than sitting down and doing uh, seated footwork. The advantages are you're actually going to be working with the human body, kind of like how it actually locomotes through space with the foot on the ground. So when you have one foot intersecting the ground, that is a nice solid, uh, that's how we normally work. Our feet are touching something solid and then the hips and body move through space. Whereas anytime you're working with something like uh, sitting on the chair, it's actually a little bit artificial. You're isolating the person. Basically you're keeping the body still while the foot is interacting with something unstable. And that's not how the body likes to work. Much like if you are on a uh, deck of a ship, if the deck of the ship starts to move, your body's really unhappy. Whereas if you're on something nice and solid, you can move around quite well. So therefore, now we're going to replicate having your client standing and doing all kinds of regular human gait mechanics. So here we go. I'm going to have Natalie stand facing the chair on the front side. So she's going to stand here. Now I'm going to talk about how far away to stand. Uh, there's all kinds of equations that people have come up with in how to stand. But what I really want you to look at is the final product. So the final product will be, Natalie, pick one leg of your choice and put it up onto the pedal. Maybe just the toes are wrapped on. And then you push the pedal down until this thigh is 90 degrees or parallel to the ground. Now note right here that her knee is a little bit bent past 90 degrees. So I would say, let the pedal go up. Can you scooch back just a tiny bit and then re-interface with that um, chair and push the pedal down. Good, that looks a little bit better. So you got a 90 degree angle at the hip, 90 degree angle at the knee. Now, this is not something that is quote unquote comfortable for your client. It's not supposed to be, it's an exercise. So therefore, this is hard to maintain. I'm gonna have Natalie start to pump the pedal up and down just a little bit. Now, I could just leave it at that, but I'm gonna explain a little bit more about what's going on and all the things that you're going to see as a teacher when you're teaching this exercise. So Natalie, let that thing come on up. Now, even with how strong she is, notice how she was having trouble holding on to this pedal and moving it up and down with clarity. So this is what your clients are going to do all the time. You're gonna find that your clients, they'll do this and when, when they find out it's a little bit difficult, they will instinctively shuffle forward. So try this, come on forward and get a little bit closer to that and then put one foot on top of that pedal and just use your body weight, and just push it down slightly, pause. Now in this position, because she's right on top of the pedal, this position is easy to do. However, this doesn't necessarily promote the type of development that I'm looking for. Now, I'm not saying that this is wrong, but however, this gives a certain type of ease to this exercise. Maybe you wanna start your client in this position. However, note that this does introduce a greater than 90 degree bend in the knee, and that is something that you may or may not be looking for when you're working with your body. So if she pushes up and down here, you're going to have an interesting effect. Here's why. While it may feel easier and be easier in the initial positioning, the moment you start moving, because the arc of this pedal is defined, meaning it's locked into one particular arc, as you go up and down, there's gonna be a little bit of a sloshing around because the human body now is being forced to adapt to this particular arc and that may be enough to throw your client off. So relax and rest. All right, that is why I personally would recommend that you set yourself up a little bit further away from the chair. Now, in order to get the ideal dimensions of the body in rel relative to the chair, some instructors have come up with formulas such as, hey, I want you to position yourself so that your one foot length, not, not 12 inches, like your own foot length away from the frame of the chair. And then when you stand there, that kind of sort of works. So when you are teaching this exercise, you may want to use that just as a baseline. What you don't want to do is take that as gospel and say you must stand exactly one foot length away from the chair and use that as the be all end all because 
somebody may have longer feet, somebody may have shorter feet, and that may not correspond to how exactly they set themselves up. So having that particular uh, formula to measure your body might be a good starting point. But then once you get on, then you can adjust as the case may be. So, however, the value of that is that when you're teaching a class and you have your clients come on up to the chair, at the very least, if you tell them, hey, make sure that they are one foot length away from the chair, at least they know they're not gonna snuggle right up here and use that as their starting point. So this will be a starting point back here. The other thing will be make absolutely sure that you give them permission to move a little bit. If this feels a little bit off because maybe they have some type of knee injury, as you're going up and down with this pedal, you may find that there's a twinge in the back of the knee or perhaps in the ankle that's going to mean that just moving back an inch or two or moving forward an inch or two may help greatly with this exercise. All right. The spring weight that I've got here is one spring at number two. Now you feel free to play around with that a bit because depending on how tall your client is or how much you weigh, you may have to change that to get the ideal setting. So you don't want to just be married to that particular spring weight. As you do this exercise, one thing you have to think about as far as safety is your client is on one foot or if you're a practitioner, you're on one foot. So there is a chance of falling. There's a little bit of risk there. And so therefore, this exercise does work on your balance. What does that mean? It means that you have to take that into account. Also, if somebody feels that they need to improve their balance, this can be a tool that you use in order to help them with their balance. But be aware that it does challenge the balance. A lot of times when people do Pilates exercises, they see this as, you know what, okay, this is a, a formal, official Pilates exercise. As long as I'm in the right position, I'm doing this thing, I'm completely safe. Well, safe is a sliding scale in a relative term. Safety is defined by my teacher, Skip Hancock, as acceptable risk. Meaning, what's acceptable for an Olympic athlete might not be acceptable for my grandmother. So therefore, if you have somebody that ha is okay with picking one leg up off the ground, then they may find that this is perfectly acceptable. However, in order to mitigate that amount of risk, there are a couple of things that us as Pilates instructors have come up with in order to help out. And primarily among that is something called a gondola pole. All right, right now, I'm simply using a broomstick. So I'm going to have Natalie hold on to this and just she's, I'm going to let her plant this thing wherever she wants. It is a way for you to get a little bit of feedback and if you're falling, you can't catch yourself. Now, a gondola pole uh, manufactured by several different Pilates uh, uh, equipment manufacturers is usually a stick, perhaps a wooden stick, with some type of a rubber cup on the bottom so that there is a little bit of friction on the uh, on the bottom. I'm, we're just improvising here with something that we found up against the wall. So, Natalie, I'd like you to put your foot up on top of the uh, pedal. All right, then posture up and do your exercise. Just press the pedal down part way and do a small little motion up and down. Now, the same philosophy applies. We're trying to keep the pelvis stable, pelvis nice and level on both sides, uh, both front and back and from side to side and you're doing a small motion just enough so that your client is challenged as far as this goes. Now, your client may, may or may not need a gondola pole. If you do not have a gondola pole in your studio, you can improvise by utilizing other pieces of equipment. I'm gonna come over here and grab a standard Pilates box. And I'll take this away. And the box is here, she can just put her fingertips on, on here. Now the idea is that if you give somebody a way to check their balance, they may actually want to put their arm down here like this. And doing so may disrupt their posture. Watch, if Natalie puts her hand completely flat down, or if I make the mistake of moving this, relax, box a little bit too far and I force her to reach for that, what's gonna happen is try that. Put your hand on that box and I'm not paying attention to her, so put your hand nice and flat. Notice that it's completely disrupted her posture. If anything, there could be injury arising because of the fact that I misaligned her. So you wanna make sure that you position the whatever they're using as their balance aid close enough so it does not disrupt their posture. 
And also, the idea is this is simply a balance aid. So therefore, you don't want them to just put weight onto that uh, um, um, box or whatever you're using. Make sure that you have your client utilize the exercise itself as the primary thing you're doing, and that's there just in case they fall. So that right there is your regular footwork, single leg, standing. Now let's go into our side version of this. All right, come on off of there, please. I'll take this away. And then, Natalie, could you face towards the camera? And here's how you wanna set up. Now there's a biomechanical reason for setting your client up in this fashion. Slide back until the heels are level with the rear edge of your chair. And then with the feet slightly turned out, you'll want the hip that is closest to the chair to come up. That foot comes up to the front corner of this pedal. So I'm gonna just place my arm here for clarity so you can see what's going on. Now notice, standing leg is back. This leg is at an angle, the leg that is gesturing. And this foot is intersecting, whether it's toes or arches or heels, up here. Now the reason this occurs is because of how the human hip is built. If I were to position this foot backwards, I'm gonna show you what happens. So take your foot off, please. Okay, notice, if I have Natalie place this foot right here on this corner, on the same line, what happens is that this jams up. The human hip can only come out so far if, you have, if you're not a dancer. If you've trained as a dancer, that's a different story. So having this leg back, try this yourselves. When you're at home, just place your hand up against the wall and place your foot right back here. You're gonna find out that it jams up. This hip will elevate and it doesn't feel very good. So therefore, when you're working in this type of position, you want this foot forward so that there is an angle that occurs from this hip to the knee. So have that out there. Fantastic. Notice how that immediately relaxes this hip here. You have a nice levelness to her ASIS, and then she is able to perform this exercise. As she presses gently down, slightly up and down, so it's the same idea and the same attitude. This leg has a small, reflection up and down, pelvis stays still, balance is being challenged, inner thighs are slightly getting worked along with all the other hip intrinsics. So this right here is your standing sideways single leg footwork on the chair.